All right, good evening, good morning, good whenever you guys are watching this. Uh, welcome to our Christmas Eve service. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 1 tonight. Matthew chapter 1. Uh, but first of all, a quick order of business. Uh, tonight is our last night to donate to Advent Conspiracy, a uh, time where we choose to worship Christ fully during this time, which means we conspire against the world to spend less at Christmas in order to give more of our presence to our family and friends so that we could then, uh, because of that money that we save by spending less, we could give some of that away in order to show God's love for others. And because we have done been doing this, we have now passed uh, over $5,000 given, which is all going to our local LifeWise chapter so that the kids, the fifth graders, can all go to the Ark Encounter. Uh, an experience that will surely tell a better story. An impactful gift that we hope that in this gift it will draw children closer to Christ and bring them into a relationship with him. So that is just exciting and I am so thankful to all of you. Uh, let me just say thank you. You guys are the best conspirators, all right? Uh, so tomorrow is Christmas and I don't know for sure, but I am guessing that just that idea brings a wide range of emotions for people. Uh, some of you are relieved because tonight, Christmas Eve, marks the last of your family obligations. Others of you may still be feeling some stress as you have about a million things to do before the season's over. Some of you may still be wondering if you will survive this season. Uh, as for you, it is just the beginning. But wherever you are on this spectrum, it is during this time that we have a unique opportunity to spend these moments with our family. And for some of us, probably many of us, we think our family when we think of our family and the impending meeting, we have to step back, close our eyes, and take a deep breath. Because some of us can come close to just having a panic attack just by thinking about it. And maybe, let me be brutally honest here, maybe this apprehension is because most of us have some pretty messed up families, at least to some degree. In fact, I would argue that the average family is really a foreign concept today. And so during this Advent season, we look at how often our ugly words and our ugly actions are spilled on those closest to us. And they often also come from our families and on to us. And it truly seems as though it is our own families that most frustrate, annoy, irritate, and vexes us. This closely knit band that is our own, not because of choice, but because of blood, drive us crazy. And we're stuck with them. But listen, I am here today not to cause you more angst, but instead I'm here to let you know that you are in good company. I want to let you know that it is not just your family that's jacked up. But instead this evening, I want to spend our time together really looking at this and then applying this story of Christ to our lives. You see, God gave us Jesus through a family tree that shows signs of love and mercy, but also full of scandal and full of sin. Not too unlike ours. 
And in some ways, you look at it, it is the most miraculous family tree of all of history. But then in other ways, it is just the most normal because it's also so brutally human. And Matthew gives us this genealogy and it gives us the history, the miraculously ordinary history of Jesus Christ. And so let's go ahead and read the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 1. So Matthew chapter 1, and it says this, Matthew 1, verse 1. The record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asa, Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram, Jehoram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amon, Amon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. All right, I want to just stop there, and I want you to know that Matthew is doing something significant with this genealogy. Uh, through this genealogy, he is teaching us something about God and who he is. In, in short, Matthew is teaching us theology. In verse 1, Matthew states, he starts out with a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Uh, he, he records his record of genealogy is that there is a line of people who start out during the good years, go into the bad years, and then up again to the redemptive years. But these first two people, Abraham and David, these two baskets of promise, two major promises that God made are in these people in creating this family tree. The first promise was to Abraham, when he said through Abraham, his seed will be a blessing to the world. That God's mercy and love would be universally offered, not simply to the Jewish nation or a line of people, but it would be offered to the world. And to David, David, God promised that there would be a king on his throne forever. And that his kingdom would never end. Son of David, son of Abraham. The second thing I want us to notice is that Matthew lists four women in this genealogy. And when we look at this, these are, if we are honest, uh, these are the four, four of the wrong women, if, if I may. I mean, if Matthew was going to pick the true matriarchs of the faith, he would have talked about Sarah or Rebecca, Rachel, Leah. 
But instead, he picks four women who you really weren't supposed to be talking about. And Matthew is doing it on purpose. It's not by accident because, because Matthew is preaching the gospel through this genealogy. And here's what I mean about that. The first woman he mentions is Tamar. And Tamar has Judah's child. Uh, Tamar's husband had passed away, and so the birthright was supposed to continue, and so the brother was supposed to fulfill his duty and give her a child. Only she kept being passed up, and so she decides to take matters into her own hand. Um, she hears that Judah is traveling into a town one day, and so she goes to the town, dresses up like a shrine prostitute. Judah comes into town, notices her, and to make a long story short, she conceives and has Judah's child. Now, Tamar requires Judah's staff and ring as a security payment, but she disappears. Well, when Judah goes back to look for her, he can't find this temple prostitute, who he thinks she is. He's unable to find her, and so he just lets the whole thing drop. Well, about nine months later, he discovers Tamar is pregnant, and he calls for her in order to kill her. Well, Tamar shows up, sending him the ring and the staff of who she is pregnated by. And it is then that Judah realizes that it is his sin and not hers that caused this. An interesting dynamic. And God makes sure we understand that Tamar is the great, great, great grandmother of Jesus. That this is a family tree of sinful people. And it is a family tree that preaches the love of God. The second woman we see in here is Rahab. Now Rahab comes into the story when the years of the Exodus are coming to, the, to an end and the children of Israel are preparing to go into the promised land and they send spies into the promised land. And they go in to the promised land to, to scope it out and they discover the weaknesses and as they are being chased out, they go into Rahab's house and Rahab is a prostitute and she tells them this great confession of faith. She says, listen, I know that your God is going to give this land to you. I know that your God is the one who, will des who, who destroyed Egypt, who parted the Red Sea, and that your God has promised you this land. And, and when you come, she says, please protect my family and I. And so they make a deal with her and her family. And they are protected and saved. And so we see that in this lineage, this is not a pure lineage, but one that also involves a Canaanite woman with a really bad track record. But it also shows us of a God of love and mercy. Well, then Ruth comes into the story. Ruth is a Moabite, uh, someone who is not supposed to be getting into a, a family line like this. Uh, and Ruth is very much, well, she's fairly aggressive with a guy named Boaz. And the story of Ruth is all about redemption. A woman uh, who is found gleaning in a field, a woman caring for her mother-in-law, a woman desperately in need of redemption. And Boaz comes in as the kinsman redeemer and redeems her to himself. And she becomes the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus, preaching to us that this is a God who is going to be worshipped by every tribe, every nation, and every tongue, and that all people will have access to this God through Christ Jesus. 
Well, then we come to this person who really doesn't even get mentioned. All this said is Uriah's wife. I mean, she doesn't even get named. But instead, this fourth woman in our genealogy is simply mentioned by the name of her husband, Uriah. Uriah is a soldier in David's army, one of David's mighty men. And when all the kings go off to war, David stays home. And David goes out and looks out from his window one evening over his land and he sees Uriah's wife, or Bathsheba, taking a bath and he is attracted to her. And he calls to her and she becomes pregnant. Well, to make a long story short, David brings Uriah home and tries to cover his sin but when the plan fails, he just flat out has Uriah killed. And David then takes Bathsheba as his own. Adultery, murder from the best king that Israel had. So from this first line of the genealogy between David and Abraham, then these four women who are either Gentiles or morally questionable, all of whom come together to preach that this family tree is truly about God's love and mercy for all people. And believe it or not, these are the years when things are actually going right. This family turned into a nation. A nation turned into a kingdom. God gave them a, the land, a temple in the midst of the land. People with worship on their lips, people looking to God. But then the rest of this, uh, things go downhill. From Solomon to the exile, we learn that God, as well as being merciful and forgiving, that God is also holy. And he is a God of judgment against wickedness. And like in any family, when God is forgotten, things go, don't go well. And God's judgment brings them into exile. And we think, how can anything good come from a people like this? How can God bring hope to the world through a people like this? And some of you may look at your own families and ask that same question. You see the judgment of God, the holiness of God. You see what happens when God is forgotten. And you ask yourself, how can anything good come from a people like this? But you know, as we move forward in this genealogy of Christ, we also see that this is a God who is faithful to his promises. And his promises aren't dependent upon us, which is really good news for every family tree that has ever existed. You see, judgment is never the last word with God. Just when everything fell apart, God started putting everything back together. Because God is faithful to his promises. And he promised a savior. And he delivered. God's love is faithful. God's love is everlasting. All the way to the fifth woman mentioned in this genealogy. Who is Mary. See, Jesus is the fulfillment of everything the Old Testament was trying to say. Jesus is God's love and faithfulness in the flesh. The seed of Abraham, the son of David, in the womb of Mary. And when we look at this genealogy, we don't see anyone in this family that isn't in need of a faithful, loving, and merciful God. And we also learn that there isn't any family it's really gone too far. That hasn't 
that isn't too far gone. And I'm sure some of you are thinking that's impossible. You don't know my family tree. But the truth is, all things are possible with God. You see, God sent his love through his son to this messed up family. And so during this Advent season, we learn that God wants to love your family as well through you. And so if we want to take Jesus seriously, we can't simply go through the motions with our family. But instead, we need to become the hands and feet of Jesus as we live out our love to others. And so this Advent season, let me challenge you to show the love of Jesus. Tell your family you love them. Show them that you love them. Let them into your life appreciate all that they have done for you that has gone unnoticed. Be like Jesus and show love, compassion, and empathy to your family. And it is only then when we show Christ's love to others through us that we can truly love Christ and in turn show that Jesus Christ truly came into this world to give forgiveness. Let us pray this evening. Father God, again, we thank you and praise you for your grace and love. We thank you for sending your son. And Lord, we thank you for showing us that it's not just our family that's messed up, but that even your own son, the Messiah, would come from a family of full-blown sinners. But Lord, in that we find hope. Hope that you still love us, that you still show forgiveness and grace. God, let us be your instruments in our families to guide them ever closer to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, again, thank you guys for joining us. I hope you have a Merry Christmas. And until next week, God bless. Have a great week.